Muy buenos días. Damos inicio a la presente audiencia. Eh, agradeciendo la participación de todos y todas, un especial saludo a la representación de eh, la sociedad civil, peticionarios de esta audiencia, que cuando hagan uso de la palabra les vamos a, a pedir que se identifiquen en su presentación. Tenemos una lista muy larga de los peticionarios, lo que agradecemos eh, muchísimo al ilustre Estado de los Estados Unidos de América. También nuestro saludo respetuoso y nuestro especial reconocimiento por eh, su presencia en esta audiencia. A todos los participantes, asistentes, también nuestro eh, saludo y nuestro reconocimiento por eh, su participación, su asistencia. Eh, la audiencia que en el día de hoy eh, desarrollamos está identificada para tener por parte nuestra de la comisión una visibilidad de una temática de gran importancia y relevancia en materia de lo que representa la reparación integral frente a violaciones históricas y sistémicas en materia de derechos humanos, muy particularmente en contra de las personas afrodescendientes en los Estados Unidos, incluyendo el delito sobre esclavitud. Es una oportunidad para la Comisión de poder tener eh, este, este encuentro que no constituye un juicio, sino una oportunidad de plantear las posiciones de la sociedad civil, sus eh, requerimientos y poder también escuchar a las distinguidas autoridades del de gobierno de Estados Unidos en este, este tema. Como es del conocimiento de algunos, la estamos un poquito atrasados con el inicio de, de esta audiencia. Vamos a darle 15 minutos a ambas partes para que puedan exponer eh, sus argumentos. Lo que les voy a pedir es que ustedes pueden distribuirse en el, el tiempo eh, como a bien ustedes dispongan y luego la comisión tendrá la oportunidad de hacer algunas, eh, algunos comentarios o algunas preguntas. Vamos de inmediato a darle la palabra a la representación de los peticionarios de esta audiencia. Yes, good morning. My name is Justin Hansford. I'm the executive director of the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard University School of Law, and it is my honor to begin our presentation today. The center thanks the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for granting our petition for a hearing on reparations for slavery and other forms of structural discrimination in the United States. The year 2019 has been recognized as the 400th anniversary of the presence of people of African descent in this country. Auspiciously, this is the year that the struggle for reparations in the United States, a struggle which began even before enslavement itself ended on these shores, has reached its zenith. We are proud bearers of that flame and keepers of that legacy. In the course of that 400-year time period, never has the movement for reparations had more mainstream support than it does today. Lawmakers on the federal, state, and local level, universities, faith-based institutions, and other organizations have begun to explore and implement 
different models of reparations. Perhaps most notably, H.R. 40, the reparations bill introduced by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, has over 100 congressional co-sponsors. It has been backed by multiple candidates for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States. This is why we, we believe that now is perhaps the most impactful moment in recent memory for this body to add its expertise on reparations to the struggle for reparations for Afro-descendants in the United States. The idea that this conversation can be profoundly enriched by the expertise of the global human rights community and this body in particular is the fundamental assumption that guided our decision to request today's hearing. Our panelists today include reparations scholars, grassroots advocates, and direct descendants of those enslaved who have been actively engaged in reparations programs in a variety of sectors. They will explain the urgent need for a systemic approach to reparatory justice in the United States. And they will also explain the severe limitations of the current reparations efforts that have been implemented up until today. Petitioners have also submitted written statements from interested organizations, including uh, members of Congress or a member of Congress, and we will continue to provide more information to the commission. Uh, a stance by the commission supporting reparations and providing technical assistance on the most effective methods for administering a reparations project would exist not within a vacuum. Earlier this year in August, the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Racial Intolerance issued a 23-page report detailing not only the moral need for reparations, but the duty of the United States and other states to provide reparations for transatlantic slavery and racial discrimination under international human rights law. This follows a 2016 report by the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, which issued a similar recommendation. And most recently, in March of this year, this body itself recommended reparations in a report which explored police violence against Afro-descendants in the United States. At the conclusion of this panel, we will offer more recommendations for federal, state, and local government actors, as well as recommendations for the commission as we continue to engage in this important work. However, as this, this conversation continues to progress, it is your recommendations to us that we await with anxious and expectant um, expectation and anticipation because we know that you will not fail us in our plea today. Uh, the next speaker will be attorney Nkichi Taifa, uh, who, who will introduce herself. Thank you. My name is Nikichi Taifa. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before this distinguished body. I am a member of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and the National Conference of Black Lawyers, both of whom submitted letters in support of today's thematic hearing. And I wish to incorporate by reference those letters as part of my uh, uh, testimony. I am also a commissioner on the National African American Reparations uh, Commission, and I testify today on its uh, behalf. I've been asked to speak to the history and development of the reparations movement in the United States, um, which in my oral testimony, I'm limited to two and a half minutes, but I have submitted some written testimony where I go in uh, detail. <laughs> Thank you very much. The quest for reparations for the descendants of African people enslaved in the United States is not novel, nor is the demand for such compensation uh, new. Whether we are speaking of Belinda Royal or Kelly House and Isaiah Dickinson of the 18th and 19th centuries, whether we're talking about the Garvey movement in the 1920s, the Queen Mother Moore and, um, um, and in the 50s and 60s, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, 
uh, the Black Panther Party, Republican New Africa, uh, National Black United Front, and so, so many others, there has never been any substantial period in history where the call for redress has been, uh, uh, has been neglected. Uh, but since the creation of FINCOBA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America in 1987, the demand for reparations in the United States substantially leaped forward, generating what I call the modern day reparations uh, movement. In 1988, the United States government authorized the payment of $20,000 to each Japanese American detention camp a survivor, a trust fund to be used to educate Americans about the sufferings of the Japanese Americans during World War II, a formal apology from the United States government and a pardon for all of those who resisted detention camp internment. Encouraged by this bill in 1989, Congressman John Conyers introduced H.R. 40 to establish a commission to study the issue and make recommendations to the Congress for remedy. Although the issue of reparations for African Americans was once in the not too distant past unthinkable by mainstream America as viable public policy, since the introduction of H.R. 40, several state legislators and scores of city councils across the country have either passed reparations type legislation or endorsed H.R. 40. Corporations, companies, and industries have been challenged who benefited from the profits made from the trafficking in human beings during the enslavement era. Universities and Religious institutions have been confronted. Scholars and journalists have written extensively on the issue, one of the most recent well-known being ta Coates. In 2015, the National African American Reparations Commission was formed, which advanced a comprehensive yet preliminary 10-point reparations program to guide reparatory justice demands by people of African descent in the United States. Despite a resurfacing, of white supremacy in the United States, there is optimism in the air. Today, the quest to have reparations seen as a legitimate concept for African Americans is becoming a reality. I would like to conclude with the inspirational words um, of wisdom of the great anti-slavery orator Frederick Douglass, who stated, power concedes nothing without a demand. The demand has continuously been made, and the time to seriously consider reparations for black people in the United States has finally come. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Eric Miller, and I'm a professor of law at uh, Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, and I'm honored to testify today. The legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation separates, and, sorry, shapes and stains the political and social institutions of the United States of America. Federal and state governments perpetrate and promote race-based intergenerational wrongs through policies that target, target and subordinate African Americans. I'll make the following three points. First, national, state, and local governments impose systemic, institutionalized, and race-based harms on African Americans. Second, these state-sponsored racial harms are designed to have an intergenerational impact. Third, their effect is to disempower African Americans politically, socially, economically, and culturally. First, federal, state, governments perpetrated the massive race-targeted exclusion of African Americans by denying equal access to housing, education, health care, agricultural benefits, and criminal justice, as well as the equal enforcement of laws through the court system. The effects of these state and local policies include racial, wealth, and health gaps, educational and environmental segregation, and disproportionate representation in the criminal justice system. Second, intergenerational harms are group-targeted acts of physical, economic, cultural, or social exclusion of members of the victim group, in this case, African Americans. Intergenerational harms perpetuate segregation and subordination, both in law and in fact, to exclude directly and disparately harmed me members of the victim group from full participation in society, across communities, and over time, from one generation to the next. Third, individually and collectively, these impacts disempower African Americans politically, socially, economically, and culturally. We demand the government remedy the continuing impact of this intergenerational, institutional, race-based discrimination and domination by adopting laws that first waive sovereign immunity to hold federal and state institutions accountable for their wrongdoing, second, waive the statute of limitations to enable recovery for extraordinary race-targeted harm that has continuing effect on the African-American community, and third, 
permits suit by descendants of individuals targeted for intergenerational harms by state institutions and officials or individuals supported by those state institutions and officials. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity, uh, commissioners and uh, Madam President. My name is Carlton Waterhouse and I'm a professor of law at the Howard University School of Law and the director of their Center for Environmental Justice. I'm here to talk to you today about the ongoing and historic harms that have been suffered by Afro descendants in the United States in the context of the environment. These harms have been made notable in a number of very popular cases, for example, in Flint, Michigan, where residents have been subjected to mis, uh, um, to mis um, treatment and abuse at the hands of government officials, neglect through decision making at the federal, state, and at the local level, and children have been harmed by exposure to lead uh, at levels when, at which they have incurred lifelong ailments uh, that will cognitively harm them throughout the rest of their lives. This is just one example of a number of instances how in the environmental context we find that Afro descendants have a different experience of life in the United States. This is replicated by disproportionate exposure to nitric, uh, nitric oxide as well as to uh, um, asthma causing pollutants such as ozone. Uh, as well as proximity and location to hazardous waste landfills, toxic waste sites, uncontrolled landfills, uh, unclean water sources, and a number of other pollutants. Um, this has been neglected at significant levels at the federal, state, and um, other levels of government, and the courts have not effectively provided remedies under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, nor under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or other authorities that have been made available. I look forward to speaking further during the question and answer period. Uh, good morning, my name is Montega Simmons. Uh, I'd first like to extend thanks to the Commission and to the Thurgood Marshall Center for inviting us. I'm here today joining you from St. Louis, Missouri on behalf of the Movement for Black Lives. We are a collective of more than 50 organizations representing thousands of black people across the United States. We came together in response to escalating state violence against black people, executed both extrajudicially and under color of law. We joined together to assert a common vision articulated through our Vision for Black Lives platform. The vision explicitly rejects false solutions that aim to reform and reshape systems that were designed to control our movement, exploit our labor, our labor, cage, and kill our bodies since our ancestors were first kidnapped and brought to these shores. At the core of our shared vision, we collectively affirm that we stand with descendants of African people all over the world in an ongoing call and struggle for reparations for the historic and ongoing harms of colonialism and slavery. The Movement for Black Lives embraces reparation at the heart of our vision in no small part because it requires that our government both acknowledge the harm that is committed or sanctioned and cease what we've described in our Vision for Black Lives platform as an ongoing war against black people. We assert it recognizing that precedent now exists embodied in the Chicago's torture case. This case was actually first brought to this body in 2005 by Standish Kwame Williams, Willis, founder of Black People Against Police Torture. Uh, they secured a finding from the UN Committee Against Torture calling the United States government to get, investigate the cases, bring the perpetrators to justice. Following media outrage and public pressure, John Burge was prosecuted, convicted for perjury and obstruction of justice for lying about the torture and other de detectives committed. Uh, he could no longer be prosecuted for his actions due to the expiration of the statute of limitations. But this case explicitly both sets a precedent and demonstrates that the government is capable of rewarding. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of this. My name is Melisande Short Cologne. I am a student at Georgetown University. Uh, and I am there as a legacy student because in 1838, the Jesuits sold my family and many other families like mine for the greater good. Just not the greater good of the people who were sold. Um, we are here today discussing matters 
concerning the many generations of the families of those people who were sold for the greater good. And has the greater good in any way come to benefit them? 242 years later, 180 years later, 300 years later, 400 years later. We are prepared at this time and we can have access to more information than people have ever had before about racism. Its effects, its multi-generational damage to not just people who are black, but to the white folks too. Because people who walk around believing that they are superior to other people because of the color of their skin are misinformed and mentally ill. And until we do something to, to address the finite causes of white supremacy in America and the world, we can't repair or reconcile anybody to anything because nobody is safe anywhere. I grew up in an America, I was born in 1954. In 1964, black people were being blown up in churches all over America. Black children were being shot. Nobody called the mental health professionals for us. So my question is, what are you gonna do? The studies have been done we don't have to study anything. There are economic studies, there are real estate studies, there are medical studies, there are incarceration studies, there are educational studies, there are medical studies. How much more studying must we do? What we need to do is have people who are dedicated to making a definitive and permanent change. And if you're not willing to do that, we don't need to continue like this. I've been knowing all of my life and everybody sitting on this side of the table who was born in America, what racism looks like, smells like, tastes like, and feels like. People who are on the other side of the table have the opportunity to mythologize the realities of people who are not you. You need to stop and you need to be accountable and we need to save what we can save while we can save it. Because we can do that. Gracias. Gracias. Eh, vamos a darle la palabra a la representación del ilustre Estado de Estados Unidos. Eh, bueno, la participación de la sociedad civil se, oh, nos, excedi my, uh, se, yeah. so se nos excedió, pero eh, bueno, sabemos que es importante escucharles y realmente así es, ¿no? Vamos a ver cómo distribuimos entonces la segunda parte en los minutos. Inmediatamente la palabra al Estado. Good morning, um, commissioners and secretariat colleagues and civil society friends at the other table. My name is Alexis Ludwig and I'm the deputy permanent representative at the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. And it's an honor to appear before you today uh, to re reiterate our support for the important work of the Commission across the hemisphere. Our civil society friends have raised today an important issue that continues to be the subject of significant national discussion and debate here in the United States. Reparations for historic grievances stemming from slavery and structural racial discrimination. We fully appreciate the linkage that has been drawn between these past events and contemporary ones, 
But from the perspective of international human rights law, this distinction between historical wrongs and current ones is significant. Since the focus of today's hearing is international human rights law, we will begin by outlining the United States' relevant international legal obligations. We will then discuss a number of reasons why international human rights law is an inadequate tool and the Commission an inappropriate forum to address these kinds of historical wrongs. And since our arguments are very legal and constitutional in nature, I will turn to our, my attorney colleague, Brian Kelly. Hi, I'm Brian Kelly. I'm from the Office of the Legal Advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Um, let me just first take the opportunity to again thank the Commission and thank our friends in civil society for giving us the opportunity and the privilege to be here and just hear such a moving, full, and powerful presentation and you know, acknowledging that this is a very important discussion to have and we're privileged to be here and have it with you. So thank you. I thought it would be helpful up at the outset to uh, begin by noting that slavery and racial discrimination are prohibited today under international law that's binding on the United States. As I'll explain, the United States understands the sources of these obligations to be a mix of treaty law and customary international law, informed as appropriate by relevant political commitments that the United States has made in several non-binding international instruments. With respect to the prohibition of slavery, the United States has international legal obligations under various multilateral agreements, dating back to the 1890 General Act for the Repression of the African Slave Trade. These include obligations under the 1926 Slavery Convention, which entered into force in 1927 and to which the United States acceded in 1929, its Protocol, which entered into force in 1953 and to which the United States acceded in 1956, and the Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery, the Slave Trade, and Institutions and Practices Similar to Slavery, which entered into force in 1957 and to which the United States acceded in 1967. Under these treaties, state parties, such as the United States, undertake, among other things, to prevent and suppress the slave trade, to bring about the complete elimination of slavery in all its forms, and to impose criminal penalties for slave trading, slaveholding, and enslavement. The United States is also a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, which entered into force in 1976 and to which the United States acceded in 1992. Article 8 of the ICCPR prohibits all forms of slavery and the slave trade. Now, this provision was based largely on Article 4 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR, which the United States was instrumental in drafting and which, while not a source of binding legal obligation on the United States, nevertheless constitutes a political commitment of significant moral weight. Moreover, since the drafting of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the United States has repeatedly recognized the prohibition of slavery as a peremptory norm. That is, a rule of customary international law from which no derogation is permitted. Now, with respect to the prohibition of racial discrimination, the United States is a party to the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the CERD. The CERD entered into force in 1969 and entered into effect with, with respect to the United States upon ratification in 1994. The CERD sets out a broad array of specific obligations that state parties have undertaken to eliminate racial discrimination in various fields of public life. Uh, to be sure, the United States is also bound under the ICCPR to respect and ensure the civil and political rights of all persons within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction without distinction on the basis of race, and to guarantee all persons equal and effective protection against discrimination on the basis of race. While they are not sources of binding legal obligations as a matter of international law, it's also worth noting that the United States has made significant political commitments under the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man and the UDHR to prohibit discrimination on the basis of race. Finally, the United States has recognized the prohibition of apartheid as a rule of customary international law from which no derogation is permitted. In sum, this multitude of international instruments and areas of customary international law 
clearly underscores the weight and the gravity of the prohibitions on slavery and racial discrimination from the perspective of international law. In recognition of this, as well as the historic wrongs and painful legacy that our friends in civil society have spoken so movingly about today, we'd like to take this opportunity to emphasize again that the United States takes its international legal obligations with respect to slavery and discrimination very seriously. Now, one important caveat that we must note with respect to these instruments is that the ratione materiae competence of this commission is limited under its rules of procedure. For a petition to be admissible before the commission, it must satisfy the requirements of the rules. Article 34A of the rules, applicable by operation of Article 52, provides that, quote, the commission shall declare any petitioner case inadmissible when it does not state facts that tend to establish a violation of the rights referred to in Article 27 of these rules. Article 27, in turn, directs the commission to, quote, consider petitions regarding alleged violations of the human rights enshrined in the American Convention on Human Rights and other applicable instruments. For the United States, the American Declaration is the only applicable instrument. For that reason, notwithstanding the seriousness with which the United States takes its obligations under international law, or the gravity of the historic wrongs of slavery and the painful legacy our friends in civil society have spoken so movingly about just now, all of the instruments and sources of law that we have identified fall beyond the competence of the commission under its rules of procedure. To be sure, we welcome the opportunity to address this important topic, uh, but our discussion here should not be construed as suggesting that the commission has competence to make recommendations pursuant to obligations the United States has undertaken under those instruments. And the same applies with respect to customary international law. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, distinguished commissioners and civil society friends. My name is Thomas Weatherall, and I'm an attorney advisor at the US Department of State. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing. I think it's a very important one. Obviously, the topic is a very sensitive one, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we turn now to the intertemporal principle, a general principle of law which applies to all international legal obligations. It is axiomatic that the existence of an obligation must be established prior to establishing a breach of such obligation. In the absence of an obligation, there can be no breach arising therefrom. Put differently, for responsibility to exist, a breach can only occur at a time when the state is bound by an obligation. This principle is reflected in Article 13 of the International Law Commission's draft articles on state responsibility, which reads, quote, an act of a state does not constitute a breach of an international obligation unless the state is bound by the obligation in question at the time the act occurs. This principle has been invoked by many international tribunals and is reflected in state practice. With respect to international agreements, this principle is articulated in Article 28 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and while not binding on the United States, Article 28 reflects customary international law. That article reads, quote, unless a different intention appears from the treaty or is otherwise established, its provisions do not bind a party in relation to any act or fact which took place or any situation which ceased to exist before the date of the entry into force of the treaty with respect to that party. Now, to be sure, the Vienna Convention recognizes that the intertemporal principle also applies in cases regarding peremptory norms of general international law from which no integration is permitted. And this is found at Articles 64 and 71 of the Vienna Convention. The intertemporal principle is reflected in the rules and practice of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights as well as this commission. Specifically, the intertemporal rule finds expression through the limitation of the competence ratione temporis of both the Inter-American Court and the commission. For example, in its 2004 preliminary objections judgment in the Alfonso Martin Del Campo Dodd case, the Inter-American Court held that it lacked competence ratione temporis because the alleged events ceased to exist prior to the court having cognizance over the supposed violations. Similarly, in its 2001 preliminary objections judgment in the Cantos case, the Inter-American Court recognized that the principle of non-retroactivity of international norms is embodied in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Therefore, for purposes of the Commission's competence with respect to the United States, the relevant instrument, the American Declaration, 
could not be applied to claims brought against the United States prior to the beginning of the competence of the Commission in 1951. A necessary corollary to the intertemporal principle is that there is no obligation to provide a remedy without a cognizable underlying violation. It is a general principle of international law that a state is required to provide a remedy only when there has been a cognizable violation of an, inter of an underlying human rights law obligation. The Human Rights Committee's consideration of this issue in RAVN et al. v. Argentina is instructive. In that case, the committee reasoned that, quote, under Article 2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the right to a remedy arises only after a violation of a covenant right has been established. However, the events of disappearance and death, which could have constituted violations of several articles of the covenant, and in respect of which remedies could have been invoked, occurred prior to the entry into force of the covenant and of the optional protocol for Argentina. Therefore, the matter cannot be considered by the committee as this aspect of the communication is inadmissible, ratione temporis, end quote. It follows that where the underlying alleged human rights violations are not cognizable under the intertemporal rule, claims to a remedy for such alleged violations would fall outside the ratione temporis competence of the commission. The intertemporal rule is particularly relevant in the context of historic wrongs based in conduct that occurred before the state in question undertook relevant international legal obligations. Where the conduct occurred prior to the existence of any international legal obligations, it cannot constitute a violation of those subsequent obligations. This remains the case even where the repercussions of the conduct continue after the state assumes the relevant legal obligations. In other words, international law is not retroactive and violations of international legal obligations cannot be substantiated by conduct that occurred prior to a state's undertaking of those obligations. Now, to be sure, international law does not preclude a state from agreeing to provide compensation for harm caused by conduct that was not at the time a breach of an international legal obligation in force for the state. And it may well be that a state decides as a matter of policy that it is necessary and appropriate to make amends for historic wrongs informed as appropriate by that state's conceptions of morality and justice. However, that does not mean that international human rights law requires the state to provide such compensation. This is the legal space we are operating in when con contemplating reparations for the kinds of historic wrongs that our civil society friends have raised today. Another principle that prevents the Commission from using international human rights law to address these kinds of historic wrongs is the prohibition against actio popularis actions for human rights violations. Generally speaking, a claimant alleging a violation of human rights law is required to show that the rights of that particular individual have been violated. The rules and practice of this Commission reflect a bar to actio popularis. This requirement is enshrined in the Commission's rules of procedure. Article 28 of the rules, for example, requires that petitions include, quote, the name of the person or persons making the denunciation, end quote. As explained by this commission in several cases, including the Operation Gatekeeper matter involving the United States, quote, the commission must take into consideration the fact that its instruments do not allow for an actio popularis, end quote. A similar example can be found in the commission's 1996 admissibility decision in the Montoya Gonzalez case. Similarly, with respect to the ICCPR, the rules of procedure of the Human Rights Committee require that, quote, the individual claims in a manner sufficiently substantiated to be a victim of a violation by that state party of any of the rights set forth in the covenant, end quote. This bar on actio popularis claims for human rights violations makes international human rights law a poor tool for seeking redress for historic wrongs in practice. For instance, even in cases where a state is bound at the relevant time by international legal obligations, which again is not the case here, international human rights law would generally require a petitioning individual to allege that they have suffered a particularized violation of their human rights. Claimants seeking redress for historic wrongs by their nature are not likely to satisfy the standing requirement as a factual matter, irrespective of the severity or gravity of the wrongs in question. And consequently, an otherwise competent adjudicative body will lack the competence ratione personae to entertain their claims. My name is Jenny Munoz from the US Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs um, from the Race and Ethnic and Social Inclusion Unit. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. In, 
In summary, the, we would like to conclude that, uni that the United States takes its international legal obligations regarding slavery and racial discrimination seriously. However, the principles um, that my colleagues discussed today demonstrate why international human rights law is not an appropriate tool with which to seek redress for these kinds of historic wrongs. To be sure, international law does not preclude a state's policy or political mechanisms from seeking to provide reparation for the state's historic wrongs. In that regard, we know that this issue is currently the topic of significant national discourse in the United States. That, not human rights law as a body of international law or commission as a forum, is the appropriate means for our friends in civil society to seek to address the concerns they have, they have discussed today and raised today. With that said, we would like to emphasize that valuing our diversity, respecting it, and recognizing its contributions to our society is not only the more morally just thing to do, it is also necessary for sustainable economic growth and prosperity throughout the region. In order to achieve shared prosperity and stability, we must empower all members of our society to fully participate in political and economic life. We must be deliberate to ensure there are ample opportunities to do so. And creating opportunity and strengthening the rule of law for all require addressing underlying causes of crime and inequality, such as poverty, unemployment, lack of access to education, health care, and weak institutions that foster corruption and impunity. Policies and programs must be designed and implemented with, for, and by the populations they intend to serve. Historically, historically marginalized groups must participate more fully in security efforts to ensure effectiveness and long-term security. While uh, progress has been made in the United States toward reducing the discrimination and inequality and ensuring equal opportunity for all, we know that we are not yet where we need to be. We are aware that combating inequality and discrimination is not just a domestic issue, it is a challenge every nation faces and challenge we can all work together to overcome. We will continue to speak out on those issues because we know our own history. It is precisely because we are imperfect that it, we believe it is appropriate to stand up. We are committed to promoting social inclusion and advancing inclusive security and growth in the region. We do this in part through initiatives that engage historically marginalized groups and address the underlying causes of inequality by improving access to justice services and economic opportunities. On the international uh, sphere, bilateral, bilateral initiatives on racial and ethnic equality between the U.S. and Colombia, Brazil, and Uruguay, which include civil society, are just some of the examples of how we explore best practices to improve racial equality across the hemisphere. The International Decade for People of African Descent is an opportunity for a positive discourse on U.S. civil rights, highlighting over 50 years of progress under the U.S. Civil Rights Act and the narrative of common challenges following high-profile incidents in Ferguson, New York City, Cleveland, Baltimore, and Charlottesville. And we value this exchange with hemispheric partners to find solutions to common challenges. We would like to conclude by once again thanking the Commission for bringing us together today and engaging on this difficult topic. And we would also like to thank our civil society friends for requesting the hearing and joining us here today. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Um, voy a um, iniciar la participación de la comisión eh, haciendo una consideración eh, muy eh, especial por parte de lo que a la Comisión corresponde en materia de la protección de los derechos humanos de todo el continente, de todas las personas, sin exclusión alguna. Las audiencias constituyen para la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos una herramienta para el desarrollo de nuestros mandatos y muy particularmente eh, la audiencia que no se trata de un juicio, que no se trata de una determinación de responsabilidades, es en, ese, en esa búsqueda de parte de la Comisión del cumplimiento de su mandato, un camino para tender puentes de comunicación y tener la oportunidad de escuchar a ambas partes y yo hago un reconocimiento al Estado 
cuando implica que el tema es un debate nacional. Y eso para nosotros es importante escucharlo por parte del Estado. Es una consideración que el tema tiene una relevancia jurídica, social, económica, y que de esta forma eh, el Estado hace un reconocimiento de todo lo que representan sus obligaciones jurídicas. Y efectivamente el enunciado de eh, los principios eh, que invoca el Estado para eh, señalar la, la, la no correspondencia de nuestra de la comisión para, para atenderlo, yo quiero dejar planteado que nuestro propósito es este, tender un puente de comunicación que nos permita escuchar el clamor de una petición y escuchar al Estado sus argumentaciones. Entonces, eh, voy a darle la palabra a la comisionada Antonia, para eh, que exprese sus consideraciones. Um, thank you, Madam President. Yes, um, first of all, yes, I, I would like to to um, insist on what um, the President has said, that this, this hearing is in the context of the mandate of the Inter-American Commission to monitor the human rights situations in the Americas. And in this specific case, um, the, the, the object of the hearing is to listen to the petitioners about the disproportionate effect of slavery in today's situation of the structural discrimination that affects Afro-descendants, we have been listening to the petitioners about addressing the inequality, the issues of environmental effects on Afro-descendants, the issues about imprisonment, police um, violence against Afro-descendants, and also you have addressed reparation, but you have addressed all the structural problems Afro-descendants um, today um, are uh, suffering um, as a cause of slavery, but you have addressed a lot of issues regarding structural discrimination, and one of those issues is reparation. But I want to insist that the objective of this hearing is to monitor the situations of a human rights situation, and in this case, is the situation of Afro-descendants in the United States of America, and one issue is regarding the reparation. So it is in, in our mandate to have this hearing, and I think it's very important that we insist on that. There is, this is a mandate of the Human Rights, of the Human Rights Com Commission, and I think it's very important to insist on that. Um, the, the state has addressed that the reparation issue is not an issue that must be solved um, by the international human rights law. And so it should not be discussed here. Like the President said, this is not uh, a trial. This is not a petition. This is just a hearing. We are listening to the petitioners. We are listening to the state. We just want to have a dialogue here. We are not deciding absolutely anything. I think it is very important to build a bridge and to address an issue that not only here in the US, not only the Commission, but in the world is something that drives attention. And it's the structural discrimination against Afro-descendants in the US. So I think it's very important that we look at each other like, like the lady here was talking to the state saying, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, it's a fact, even though there has been a lot of advancement on the issues, it is a fact, and I think it's very important when you have a situation like you have here in the US, that you, would, you, you recognize the fact and say, what can we do? And that's one of the objectives we have at the hearings, is to look at ourselves and say, 
you know what, what can we do to address these issues? And the Commission is here to help the petitioners and to help the state and say, how can we help to move on? And that's the whole objective of this hearing. This is not a trial. Okay, this is not a trial, and I think it's very important to understand that. So, really, I think it is very important that you asked for this hearing, and I want to thank you. And I hope that after this, we can build a bridge and see how we can help to start working together. And in that sense, the Commission has all the disposition to help the state and see how we can, you know, build step by step and see how we can start working together. And like you said, what are we going to do? We're all here, so let's see what are we going to do. This is something that everybody has to face and start working together, not face, not, you know, not, you're not enemies. Yeah. You all belong to one country. So I think it's very important that. And then finally, I'd, I'm very interested if the state could share with us um, um, your papers, um, just as a legal exercise, <laughs> um, to see, um, yes, for us it's very important to see why, why in the opinion of, of, the, of the state, um, an issue such as reparations cannot be discussed in the international, uh, international law. Because the Commission okay. has done a lot of reparations in other countries and has applied international law. And as a rapporteur of truth, justice, and memory, truth, and justice, we have a lot of cases in other countries where we do discuss reparations and we do apply international law. So I am very interested in if you could share with us what you have read, because it's it would be very interesting to see that, and we can discuss yeah. it in another in an, in another occasion. Okay, thank you very much. Gracias, comisionada, comisionada Margaret. Good morning, everyone. Um, as the rapporteur for the United States and for Afro-descendants rights and against racial discrimination. I ask Madam President that I speak after <laughs> the, first, the second Vice President because this is a matter, not only am I interested in it as a lawyer, as an African, because I was born in Africa, um, it's a matter that tugs in my heart and it's a weeping wound which exists, but well, not only in the United States. The issue of reparation is being discussed all over the world where there are Afro-descendants. It's, it's being discussed. There was a case in England some years ago when a number of people filed a claim in the English court and succeeded in their claim as a, a descendants of ex-colonial persons who had suffered during the colonialism of Britain in their country. Uh, so it, it's an, I, as a lawyer, I'm interested, this is why we, we hope you can give us your copies of your paper because I would love to study them properly. And, and I know that Harvard University will be studying them very avidly. And this matter is not closed. It cannot be closed today. We cannot sort it out today. And, and we hope that we will have more fruitful, more informed uh, um, sessions later, and maybe even a working meeting after, after um, this event, because um, this is what we're here for. We're here to listen to people who believe that their rights have been violated and to see what the commission as the, the protector and promoter of human rights in the region can assist them to gain from the other side who they say has violated their rights. And when I say the other side, I agree with, with um, Antonia. I said it earlier to you informally that you all want and you ought to be, but you're not yet. 
this is a, a fact. And I think wounds have to be healed. And I've often wondered, as the rapporteur of Afro-descendant rights, where I speak about it all over the Americas, why is it that no one has even said, we are sorry for what they did back then? Why? To my mind, it's a simple thing. It does not tie you up legally, and one cannot only act on legal obligation. One has to act on morality as well. What is most moral to be done? Because laws are based on morals. So why, for memory, truth, and justice, a rapporteurship, it's important. And it's important for the wounds to be healed by a simple act and statement of apology. And that is not done. That isn't done. Why? Is it because you don't recognize that there was a wrong done? But these are all the things I understand my brothers and sisters have spoken about here. And oh, I, I should say when brothers and sisters, we have to acknowledge that the uh, um, a Congresswoman Sheila Jackson is, is here present and sitting there. Madam Congresswoman, thank you for coming to, to this session. Um, this is a matter, as I say, that it's not only legal obligation that one thinks of. This is a matter of a wrong was done to ancestors. And I think I said earlier in the previous hearing, um, uh, after we finished with the indigenous people of Canada, that we ought to do a proper, proper study of the genocide committed against mm. the Afro-descendants and that committed against indigenous people. And I think the numbers are needed to shock the world. I think so. And I think we ought to seriously work on that and as quickly as possible to publish this. And as your university is so involved in the issue, perhaps you, we can take it up. Certainly. Because we really need to do that. We need to do the history, the perfect numbers. I, 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 and then, perhaps, others whose ancestors did not go through what black ancestry went through would recognize the wrong done to a people and which they're still feeling today. And let's face it, they're the current, because the, 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 the purpose of the hearing also <laughs> talks about the excessive force and police violence and mass incarceration and other persistent forms of discrimination going on now. Now, today. Even today, I'm sure lots of, a number of black people have been killed in the United States. And who and the perpetrators will not be brought to account for some reason or the other. But there's one thing I want to mention. In in your uh, Mr. Kelly, um, you said that the, the U.S. is a party to the um, Global Convention or um, against all forms of racial discrimination. That being the case, I want to ask you that I hope on that basis the U.S is seriously considering ratifying the Inter-American Convention against racial, racism, racial discrimination, and all forms of intolerance. And we hope to hear from you positively about that shortly. Thank you. Gracias, eh, comisionada. Um, voy a darles la palabra. <coughs> Nos hemos excedido un tanto Eh, pero creo que ameritaba este espacio. Eh, voy a darles cinco minutos para que eh, eh, puedan hacer algunos comentarios eh, y le vamos a dar la palabra a la congresista Sheila Jackson. Eh, ¿Es correcto el nombre así? <ríe> Quizás no está pronunciado como debe. Eh, que se nos había señalado eh, al inicio de la eh, sesión que eh, la congresista iba a llegar un poco después en razón de que estaba eh, eh, participando en un, en un evento en el Congreso. Entonces, eh, le, le paso la palabra a la sociedad civil y ustedes 
eh, los cinco minutos que tenemos para distribuirlos como ustedes tengan, dándole la palabra entonces a la congresista. Madam President, and to all of the members of this historic commission, uh, the Commission on uh, the uh, Inter-American uh, Human Rights, uh, I'm honored and uh, very honored to be here, Madam President, uh, and to all of the commissioners. The eloquence of what I've been able to hear uh, and as well the pointed commentary is crucial. This is a very historic day. This is an international body that is holding a hearing on what the descendants of enslaved Africans have attempted to put in place, frankly, since 1989, which was the last century, even long after it should have been enacted. Let me first of all thank the representatives of my government. Um, they uh, certainly will hopefully uh, be here to convey uh, the seriousness of this day. Uh, I sit as a member of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. I'm a member of the Helsinki Commission that deals with peace and security. I'm a member of the Judiciary Committee and the Constitution Subcommittee, which I will rush back to, which is having a meeting now on the Muslim ban. Um, we are serious about our work, and I would simply say, uh, in the moments that you've given me, and I thank you for your indulgence, I am now the author and taken up uh, the uh, leadership on H.R. 40 that was previously introduced by John Conyers in 1989. In many times, it has secured two sponsors, three sponsors, 20 sponsors, in spite of the hard work of all of these individuals who have seen it firsthand. Uh, we now have a close to 130 plus sponsors of H.R. 40, including the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader of the United States Senate uh, and chairpersons of various committees. What is the reason for that? The reason is how you have articulated, first of all, People of color or African enslaved persons, uh, their descendants are scattered across the nation. I am a member of the Interparliamentary Exchange in Mexico. Um, that means that I see black populations in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, in the Northern Triangle, everywhere, including the United States. Um, that very point answers my good friends from the State Department in terms of their historical uh, misstatements. Uh, the Constitution was started in, written in, in 1787. We declared independence in 1776. Uh, I would make the point that slavery was institutionalized as a sovereign nation. We were written out of the Constitution in terms of not listed as a human being. What that means is, in spite of the fact that there may not have been uh, treaties, we were a sovereign nation in the world of nations, uh, adhering to our convictions that we must adhere to human rights. We violated it. Slavery was the original sin here in the United States. H.R. 40 is intending to correct that and begin to build a systemic uh, response. The, the mythology built around the Civil War has obscured our discussion that we were ultimately freed. The 13th Amendment came after, and the 13th Amendment said that there would be no more slavery. But we then had 100 years of Jim Crowism, which found us oppressed again. Even today, we fight against mass incarceration, which is a human rights issue. And so the idea of a commission to study reparation proposals is not only to deal with the fact of whether or not uh, you are at fault. This is not a pointed at fault. This is institutionalized by the United States government. It is a governmental response. It is not my neighbor's response. It is the United States government that institutionalized slavery and did not correct it. H.R. 40 recognizes that there is need for systemic changes and the apology, which is included in the legislation, to the descendants of Africans. It is not done as seemingly indicating uh, that we're doing it to go after individuals, that we're angry. We're doing it out of the right and upholding human rights for all people. May I just quickly say this as I come to a close? Um, it is well known uh, that we have responded in reparations before. The Japanese interned in World War II. Uh, the campaign began in 1980, a congressional bill establishing commission to investigate the internment, evaluate and consider the amount and form of reparations. 
based on the commission's finding, it was done and apology came about and reparational payment of $20,000. We have seen this occur throughout this country and throughout the history of our people. And what we're asking for is a formal acknowledgement of a historical wrong, the recognition that it is a continuing injury and the commitment to redress by the federal government which sanctioned the enslavement and subsequent discrimination uh, and the actual compensation in whatever fashion it takes. Let me just say in my appreciation for allowing us uh, to do this, we know that uh, $10 million came about to the Tuskegee syphilis. Other ways, Florida legislature paid 150000 for these 11 survivors who were in Rosewood. A whole series of evidence. So my final word to you, my, Madam President, a final word with passion, with respect for human rights, and respect for the dignity of all peoples in the world who have suffered. We do this out of a need to heal this nation and to bring about racial reconciliation and to be able to heal the toxicity that we even feel today, to heal it with a salve that will be heard around the world. We thank you and we hope that you will bring us into the fold and I will be encouraging our state and our nation to support uh, the uh, racial provision uh, that you have in acknowledging uh, that issue around the world. I yield back. I thank you for your courtesies and your graciousness and seek an apology for having to leave to go back to my hearing. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Bueno, eh, vamos a pasarle la palabra al Estado. Thank you so much. And I just want to reaffirm that our presence here underscores the importance with which we take this issue. Um, the fact that we're here listening means we care, and I think we care very, very deeply about this issue. And we don't mean to sidestep any kind of the Commission's legitimate concern. We just mean to really highlight the fact that this is a, an ongoing and in as many ways a growing discussion and debate in the United States, even in my 56 and counting years. This issue is not going away. You could think that the more it recedes in the past, the more we'll forget, well, it's clearly, I have to agree with our friends on the civil society table. We should actually all be seated at the same table. There can be disagreements on the same table, too. I, t I totally agree. But it is a conversation that is gaining resonance. We acknowledge it. It's an important national debate. It's been on some of our primetime news, on our pr premier intellectual and public uh, magazines. It matters. We agree that it matters, and that's why we're here. On the other hand, we do have certain obligations to make certain kinds of arguments as representatives of the state, and we will, all, we will make those arguments just because we have to. Yeah, I, I would just add, <clears throat> thank you again for having us. You know, that's the risk of bringing lawyers. We speak in Latin and we talk about jurisdiction and competence. Never the most, yeah, I know, of course. Um, oh, all, oh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, all to say, you know, the, the point that we were trying to make at the outset is uh, international human rights law isn't the body to make this kind of argument about historic wrongs, no matter how grave or serious, and, and the Commission's competence might not be the place, but, but we don't dispute at all the, the importance of this discussion, um, the significance of it, um, and, and, you know, the point being that uh, there are a number of forums to discuss this, and that's happening in the United States today, as we've heard about the various pieces of legislation and movements, and, um, uh, you know, it, it may well be that a state decides going through that national discourse and process that a, a reparation is, is the right way to uh, address this kind of historic wrong and this very painful legacy that has these ongoing issues that we, we've heard so movingly about from our friends in civil society. I think our point up front was just that international human rights law does not necessarily require that. And so thank you again for the privilege to, to speak with you all here and just talk about this really important issue.
I can just close by reiterating uh, some of the things my colleague Brian said. And I, I think one of the benefits of a mechanism like the commission is that notwithstanding the shortcomings we've identified, the commission still does have a role in bringing together parties to discuss important and difficult issues like the one it's brought us together to discuss today. So notwithstanding the points that we made before and notwithstanding the fact that the commission might be limited, for example, in the context of a petition-based hearing, you know, this is, I think, precisely the sort of forum where this kind of discussion is entirely appropriate. So I'd like to thank you again for bringing us together today and um, I will happily share our points with you after the hearing. Thank you. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias. Yo creo que precisamente la, la muestra de la trascendencia de lo que implica una, una, esta herramienta que utilizamos como son las audiencias, al final eso es lo importante, sentarnos y poder plantear nuestros puntos de vista. Agradeciendo a todas las partes sus aportes y sus informaciones, damos por terminada esta audiencia.